All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio on Liberty Radio Network. And uh, as you all well know, one of my favorite reporters is the heroic Robert Perry, formerly with, uh, well, I think it was AP and Newsweek. He now runs ConsortiumNews.com. You could hire him to come and give a speech to your group. Welcome to the show. How's it going, Robert? Pretty good, Scott. How are you? I'm doing great. Really appreciate you joining us on the show today. Well, thanks for having me. So I just saw this thing that blew my mind. I, I almost can't believe it, but then again, I guess it's sort of par for the course, too. Judith Miller scolds Julian Assange for not verifying sources <laughs> because he didn't care at all about attempting to verify the information that he was putting out or determine whether or not it hurt anyone. And I was thinking, well, you know, we could just talk bad about Judith Miller, but what seems most remarkable to me, Bob, is that uh, reporters like you, who, after all, you know, um, you'll know, get James Bamford or yourself or Eric Margulies, uh, you're not just alternative media, you're all, uh, you know, formerly very mainstream media, have those kind of New York, D.C. corridor type credentials and what have you, and uh, all of you who were, the you know, real reporters who were right about Iraq, uh, are still just as excluded in 2010, 2011, as you were back in 2002 and 2003. It is, and Judith Miller gets to sit here and pose like she's the uh, the benchmark for what defines good journalism. And still, what do I got to do to see Bob Perry on TV? Doesn't well, seem fair. Well, I'm not sure if, uh, the world isn't fair. I suppose, uh, Scott. I think that's uh, not like that is. It's not exactly news, but um, but it is just, it is sad. I think uh, not just for you, and me. It's sad for the American people and uh, folks who would like to know what uh, what is really going on, and not just what um, some of these pampered uh, inside the Beltway reporters uh, are willing to say. And you know what really ha- has happened is that uh, is that to keep your job or to keep your career path going in the right direction, reporters understand. Um, how far they can go in a certain way, and how they have to tailor their stories. It's not a secret. It's not spoken about openly, but it's all understood that that if you uh, go off in, in directions that uh, step on too many important toes, you're going to be in trouble. There, there's, there's this myth that still sort of prevails about the Washington Press Corps being the Watergate, Pentagon Papers Press Corps of the 70s, but that's long, long dead. Uh, and what the reality is is that... Um, if you play ball and you have good connections and you keep your skirts clean, uh, then you can have a very nice career, thanks, and have and make lots of money. Um, if you challenge too much, uh, you're, you probably can expect it at best to have a sidetracked career, if not a, a dead-ended career. So I think that's the reality. Uh, Judith Miller did was one of the few, actually, who did suffer some for, for helping to lead the U.S. Uh, uh, people into the war in Iraq, um, she did end up getting sort of finally kicked out of the New York Times, but her case was an exceptional one, and one where she she became a true uh, mouthpiece for the propagandists, and it was so obvious that the New York Times couldn't couldn't still defend her, and um, so she was sort of pushed out. But uh, she, you're right, she still has a standing, as do, as do any number of journalists who, who had had many important things wrong from the from a Chris Matthews type who was totally on board with the Iraq war, and now, of course, he says he was a critic, but you couldn't convince me back then he was, um, to people like uh, Howard Kurtz, who who's made a uh, career attacking honest journalists who who take on the tough stories, and he's now he's moved from the Washington Post to the Daily Beast, so now he's, a, he's an Internet um, guru. Um, it, that's the way it's been, and... and until until there's a, uh, a real effort to change that and to create honest institutions that'll tell the, that will be committed to tell the truth, uh, I'm not sure we're going to see it change much. Yeah. Well, you know, I kind of just want to blame the American people for basic supply and demand reasons. But then again, the government owns the airwaves, and they get to decide who owns those big broadcast uh, stations. And uh, they certainly... Uh, you know, Dan Rather in that that Bill Moyers special, Buying the War, talks about the fact that you don't need a memo to remind you that you work for a multi-billion dollar corporation that has 
tremendous lobbying needs, regulatory needs, and legislative needs in Washington, D.C. And so, you know, supply and demand doesn't really count. The, the demand is what the government demands. That's what's most important to uh, even Dan Rather. You know, he's kind of a hairdo, but he was an actual journalist at least once upon a time. Yeah, he was. And, go ahead. Yeah, he was. I mean, that's true. Dan, Dan Rather did some very good stuff, and he was punished for the, the best things he did. Right. He, you know, when he stood up to Richard Nixon and said, you know, basically challenged Nixon uh, as a liar in, when he was a White House correspondent, he was trashed for, for doing that. It turned out, of course, that Nixon was a liar. So then, then you go to him challenging George H.W. Bush uh, during the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 1988 campaign about uh, the Iran-Contra scandal and Bush's role in it. Uh, again, that uh, rather was trash for doing that, and but he was right. Bush was had been lying about his role in that and been trying to cover it up rather successfully. Uh, so whenever so and then and rather ultimately was knocked out of the box because when he when he um, uh, tr- pushed ahead on a very important story, which was Bush's uh, George W. Bush's lies about uh, uh, essentially uh, skirting his Vietnam War responsibilities by getting into. Um, this champagne unit of the Texas National Guard, and then shirking those duties. So, um, uh, and the, you know, there was that came under heavy attack, and there were some weaknesses in the piece, but overall, it was accurate. It was certainly it got the main point right that the president of the United States had shirked his his war duties. So, but again, that's what that's what caused Dan Rather to uh, be essentially knocked out of uh, the business. Mm-hmm. So, so what people get punished. And this has been a, it's not just Dan Rather. You can go through Gary Webb. You can go through any number of journalists who've seen their careers horribly scarred and destroyed um, because they were doing the, the work that supposedly the American people should want. Um, yet uh, you're right. There, there, there are powers that be that uh, in the news business um, that are that are, have much more of a uh, of an association with the with the power structure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and that, that that's what happens. And it's not, it somewhat is that, yes, General Electric owns NBC, so therefore you're dealing with a multi-billion dollar corporation that has its own interests beyond news gathering. Similarly with CBS, owned by various different corporate entities that have their large interests. Um, it makes it very difficult uh, for an honest journalist to go against those interests in any consistent way and expect to keep his job. Well, you know, I don't know if I... Uh... Just if I got this from movies, like old black and white movies or something, but I have an idea of a journalist like wearing a trench coat and chewing on a cigar, and if he was around a guy like Chuck Todd, he would just bully him and make fun of him and make fun of his haircut and make fun of the way that he kisses up to the politicians and call him a little sissy until he does his job, right? There would be this kind of peer pressure from the older guys about doing good journalism, but I, that's just complete make-believe, isn't it? No, well, that did exist. That did exist. When I arrived in Washington for the AP in, by, in 77, that was still around. There was this attitude of more of the tough, hard-bitten journalists who would look with disdain on some of these uh, the journalists who were kind of the uh, uh, kissy-face types who were trying to make their careers by by doing what the powerful wanted. Um but that was broken in the 80s. Basically, the, the, the link between that kind of journalism from your, from your old black and white movies to the present what occurred under, uh, under President Reagan uh, and through the building up of the right-wing press corps and the attack groups and um, just the corporatization of the media. Um, it became a point where uh, the, those journalists who would sort of look at you and say, why are you being such a wimp? were either forced out or retired, and a new generation came in. Yeah, they might as well all be Chuck Todd now. I can't even watch the cable TV news anymore. I try to. It's kind of my job, too, but I just I don't have the stomach for it. Um, anyway, uh, I like good journalism. We're talking with Robert Perry from ConsortiumNews.com. We'll be back after this. It's Anti-War Radio. Well, it's a proud day for America, and by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. We're dealing with Hitler Revisited. But even as planes of the multinational forces attack Iraq, I prefer to think of peace, not war. America does not seek conflict. 
they had kids in incubators and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. <laughs> All right, some of my favorite Bush senior clips from the first Gulf War uh, via Norman Solomon's movie War Made Easy. Great clips of all kinds of great stuff in uh, that movie for you. I'm in the middle of an interview here talking with Robert Perry from ConsortiumNews.com. He's a real reporter, so he doesn't write for a major paper. He writes for ConsortiumNews.com. He's the author of Lost History, Neck Deep, Secrecy and Privilege, and Trick or Treason. That one's about the October Surprise mystery. And, uh, Bob, you've been on the case of these Republican criminals for a long, long time here. Uh, the Republicans especially, and uh, of course, uh, the, one of the most controversial parts of the story of the first Gulf War is the accusation, at least, that uh, James Baker, in a way, gave Saddam Hussein a green light and told him, yeah, go ahead and take Kuwait's northern oil fields, we don't really care about that, and that uh, Saddam's problem was he pushed it too far and went all the way to the sea and conquered all of Kuwait. Uh, resulting in uh, Operation This Will Be Another Vietnam. Here we still are, uh, you know, 20 years later. In fact, as January 2011, we're 20 years into the Iraq War now. Uh, and uh, WikiLeaks has now released the Glassby Cable from July 25th, 1990. And uh, I wonder if uh, you've had a chance to take a look at it and uh, whether it's everything that you hoped it would be. Well, I'm just reading it now. You sent it to me, and um, it's, uh, it's, it does fill in some of those blanks. Um, it, uh, what it shows is that uh, Saddam Hussein, this is prior to the invasion of Kuwait, was reaching out to the United States, was uh, trying to get uh, help in, in dealing with his uh, dispute with, uh, with Kuwait. And clearly, this is a fairly friendly um, conversation between the U.S. ambassador and Saddam um, over um, efforts to to avoid a, a full scale war. Uh, and going through it immediately, I don't I don't see in this one anyway the um, a specific reference to um, to to a course of action that Saddam would follow. Obviously, things like green lights uh, tend to be somewhat subtle. Um, they're often read uh, into meetings that uh, uh, between two sides uh, without necessarily uh, some explicit instructions. Um, well, you know, but, I'm looking at number 30 here, and it says, Note, on the border question, Saddam referred to the 1961 agreement and to a line of patrol it had established. The Kuwaitis, he said, had told Mubarak Iraq was 20 kilometers in front of this line. The ambassador said that she had served in Kuwait 20 years before. Then as now, we took no position on these Arab affairs. Now, this is the, right. this is the famous quote right here. We're not interested in your border dispute with Kuwait. Is, right. that, is that a green light, Robert Perry? Well, you know, I think it's a, it may be a green light to, uh, uh, to, in terms of settling uh, a fairly modest uh, border dispute. Um, certainly it's saying that the U.S. takes no position on these kinds of intra-Arab matters. But um, you know, how, you know, how Saddam read that or how it was intended has always been a bit of uh, a point of confusion. Uh, it does, I don't see anything here that we're, where Saddam is specifically uh, given some stern uh, rebuke to, to, uh, to consider no such action. I mean, that's, that's, that's the point, I suppose. That yeah, the dog that didn't bark in here, she goes, oh, come on, we want this all to be resolved peacefully, but... That's it. Right. And I think you have to go back, of course, through this history of what happened. Um, and some of this history is still not well known or even uh, documented. Um, there was a document that I found. It was, it was a top secret document that I, I found in some files in, uh, that I was get, given access to uh, on Capitol Hill. And um, it was a, a talking point memo that Secretary of State Haig had prepared to brief President Reagan back in 81 about Haig's first trip to the Middle East. And in that, um, Haig also talked to, um, talked to Sadat, uh, President Sadat of Egypt and, uh, and Prince Fahad of Saudi Arabia and was told that, um, that Saddam had been given a quote green light from President Jimmy Carter back in 1979 to, to launch his invasion of Iran. Mm -hmm. 
and that's something that Carter has denied. But there, there is this, there, there is a lot, a lot of uh, uncertainty about the way these things work, and uh, and clearly there was an interest on the part of the Saudis and others who, who are very close to the United States, uh, as we know, um, to to get a, a sterner response against Iran at that period. So Saddam was was the guy with the army, and he was he and he was on the border with Iran. So he was in a sense. Uh, encouraged by places like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait to take the lead, they would provide some of the financing. He would provide the the, the men and the and the and the army to go punish Iran and to sort of stop this idea of this is of this Shiite Islamic fundamentalism spreading into the Persian Gulf. So so that that then led to an eight year war, uh, which I'm not I don't think Saddam had expected when it started. Obviously, um, I'm not sure either side did. Uh, at tremendous costs, both in terms of casualties and money, and that, and after that ended, then you get to this other phase that ends in '88, and so Saddam is then being uh, pressured by Kuwait and others to to pay them back, and he's turning around and saying, "Hold it, you know, I t- we we took the brunt of this, we lost you know thousands of men in in, in in individual battles, while you guys sat back with your gold your gold plated um, uh, fixtures on in your bathroom." And um, and you guys need to give us a break here. And that was that was the fight he was having with Kuwait. And there were also arguments about oil reserves and so forth. But his position wasn't as crazy as it was then presented. Um, obviously, it's wrong to invade another country, and he did do that um, because the Kuwaitis would not would not reach a, any kind of accommodation with him. He went further than I think Glasby may have sort of understood he might. Right. Um, but. Um, then, of course, the United States reaction was was to propagandize, um, and, and and there was a key phrase that you, you included there. Um, what we now know is that the Iraq War, that that war, the so-called Persian Gulf War, what did never needed to go to a ground phase. Um, basically, the the air war the U.S. launched was devastating against the Iraqis, and then it got to the to the question of whether or not U.S. would send troops in, and at that point. President Gorbachev of the Soviet Union had negotiated a deal where Saddam would, would pull his troops out, leave, leave behind even their hardware, their military hardware. Uh, but Bush Sr. did not want that to happen. He wanted to have a ground war. And, in fact, he overruled Schwarzkopf, General Schwarzkopf and others in the field who said, just let this work out. We don't need to have people die over this. We've killed enough of them. Uh, we don't need to send the U.S. troops on, on the ground through this, through the, whatever is going to happen. Right, as Bill uh, and, Hicks said, even surrendering was too little, too late, and he shot them all as they retreated from Kuwait. Right. So, but it, so, so basically, what happened was Bush, with the help of Colin Powell, who was the chief uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, worked out a way to sort of pretend like they were sort of uh, responding to Gorbachev, making it impossible for the Iraqis to leave, so they could have their ground war. And so they launched the ground war, overruling Schwarzkopf. They ordered him to go through this. He killed the U.S. forces killed uh, un- tens of thousands of Iraqis, maybe hundreds of thousands. Americans also the Americans also suffered casualties, of course, much smaller. And then after 100 hours, it was stopped. And what does Bush do? Bush goes down to that to the to the uh, and gives a talk, which you concluded that you included this clip where he says we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Right. And that was the motive. The reason we did that as a nation, the reason we we pushed this whole thing as far as we did, was because Bush Sr. saw this as a way to get the American people back behind warfare. Right. Here's, in fact, one more clip along those lines, which is really important. This will not be another Vietnam. That, that really was at the core of his argument. And, of course, it was just like Vietnam for the people of Iraq. A million of them have died, maybe two million of them have died under the blockade regime that Bush Sr. implemented and Bill Clinton enforced. And then with this current invasion since 2003, uh, it's been a, a lot like the Vietnam War for 20 years now for the people of Iraq. Um, but, uh, ah, geez, you know what? Uh, well, a couple of different things. First of all, Palast, uh, Greg Palast at the BBC, his interpretation of, uh, I don't know about this new document coming out, but um, of the situation before was that Kuwait was not so much slant drilling like they say, but they were drilling from shared pools of oil. And they were, as it says in this memo, undercutting even the OPEC price, which was way low. 
and uh, they were overproducing from this shared well in violation of their agreement with Iraq. And so, uh, according to Pallast, the way James Baker looked at it was West Texas rules. If if um, three property owners on the surface share a well underneath, and one of them goes overproducing, well, they break his knees and fix that outside the law. And that that was basically James Baker's um, you know message to Saddam was go ahead and break their knees, go ahead occupy the northern oil fields for a while, etc. Uh, you know, do something little. He just went too far. Is that consistent? Do you think is that well, about right? It's plausible. It's plausible. I'm not sure you can interpret that entirely from what you see here in, in the Glassby memo. But it's, but of course, Baker was Secretary of State, and he was um, uh, a very hard bitten kind of character. He was he was he was he did not suffer fools uh, easily, and he was one to uh, do that kind of thing, uh, knee breaking of various sorts. Usually not not physically, but uh, certainly politically. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, it's certainly it's, it's a feasible argument. But the point is, I think I think Saddam had this had, had a legitimate grievance. Um, and, yeah, the memo pretty much makes that clear. Right, and I think, uh, uh, but uh, but after that happened, that the bigger thing was that Bush came to Bush Senior saw this as a way to get the American people back in line. The big strategic concern. That the Reagan Bush people had, and it, it goes, it is, you see this in their internal documents that were now public. What they, what their, their big concern was that the American people had deserted, you might say, the empire. The American people after Vietnam did not want to go along with that stuff anymore. And they had to be re recruited back behind the war machine. And so the various steps that Reagan took, including things, small things like invading Grenada and having all that great fun about that, and the Panama invasion that, that Bush Senior that Bush Senior did before uh, the Iraq matter, um, those things were seen as intermediate steps to pull the American people back into line. They were low cost, relatively in terms of uh, casualties. They right. made the country feel good. Um, and then, of course, the big one was the Persian Gulf War which is when Bush announces we've kicked the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. That's a crucial point to understand. Yeah. Because well, you know, that, like James they, Bamford's work on uh, the Rendon Group and all that and how they sold it as Operation Yellow Ribbon and Operation American Flag and the the – uh, the media marketing campaign behind Desert Storm. I still remember so well. I was in ninth grade. And I still remember so well the we're number one kind of feeling that they really successfully pushed at the end of the Cold War. Now there's no one to oppose us. Let's go. When it could have been the other way. It could have been let's turn inward and be a normal country in a normal time. Right. And there were very, very dangerous aspects to this, too, that, that we're still living with. It happened roughly the same period. In 89, uh, when the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan, there was there were Gorbachev also at that point was offering essentially a coalition government for Afghanistan. Basically, have the the communist government, which was still in power in Kabul, work with some of the more moderate, reasonable mujahideen and set up a coalition government of compromise. Bush Senior, at the bidding of of some of the hardliners around him. Said no, we're not going to do it. We're, you know, we're going to rub the Soviet face in this, and we are going to just destroy and kill everyone who got in our way in Afghanistan. And the idea was that the that the the war would be rapidly finished. That with the next round of advances, the Mujahideen would take Kabul, kill the uh, the the, the, the Najibul, the the Soviet-backed president there, and show that the U.S. had prevailed without without any question or doubt. It was the beginning of the triumphalism. And what happened was, and this goes against the, con- the conventional wisdom that the U.S. sort of walked away immediately. It didn't happen that way. Right. The U.S. actually continued the war, continued funding the CIA operation, rejected Gorbachev, and, but, there, but the Mujahideen failed to make advances. The Soviet-backed government was still strong enough and effective enough to stop them. So it dragged on for years. It dragged on even after the Soviet Union collapsed, finally. Then a more moderate group of Mujahideen took over Kabul, kept Najibullah more or less in place. And that's when Pakistan then organizes the Taliban, which are these uh, very militant uh, young refugees from Afghanistan who are trained inside Pakistan and then unleashed into 
into Afghanistan, and they take over in 96. So we've had years of, of warfare tearing apart Afghanistan. The, 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 when, when the Taliban take over, uh, they drive out the more moderate Mujahideen forces, they capture Najibullah, and, they, and they, uh, they castrate him, torture him, and string him up by a light pole. Yeah. And well, and now was, we're fighting on the side of the communists against our friends in the Mujahideen, the Taliban. We so so, so many, many of these problems were sort of were sort of kept in place and advanced by this triumphalism, this this yeah. we're number one triumphalism, and and the consequences have been obviously extraordinary uh, in a whole variety of ways, including the fact that the Afghan war was pretty much predicated on these decisions made by Reagan and Bush back in the eighties. Yep. All right. Now, I'm sorry that we have to leave it there. We're uh, over time and have another guest coming up. But I really appreciate your time on the show and your journalism, as always, uh, everybody. That's Robert Perry, the great Robert Perry from ConsortiumNews.com, author of Lost History, Neck Deep, Secrecy and Privilege, and Trick or Treason. Happy New Year and Happy New Decade to you, Robert. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it.